Hello cruel world, my name is Dr. Shaham Das, I'm a consultant forensic psychiatrist. I assess mentally disordered offenders for a living so that you don't have to. So today I'm going to do something slightly different in this video. I'm going to experiment a bit, you know, just like your sister did in college. I'm going to do my own professional psychoanalysis of the character in the film Joker. Now you're probably thinking, Dr. Das, Joker came out such a long time ago, why are you doing this now? My response would be, firstly, call me Shaham. Also, I didn't have a YouTube channel two years ago, so I don't know, sue me. Plus, I've been really busy volunteering at my local abattoir and also protesting outside my local charity shop. So in this video, I'll be answering the following questions. In the film Joker, was the depiction of the protagonist's mental health or mental illnesses fair or accurate? How were his mental illnesses related to his eventual criminality and offending? And my professional psychoanalysis of this? And also, how does this connect in reality? So from the cases I see, how kind of in keeping is this particular case of the Joker, Arthur Fleck? I should say spoiler alert, although if you're watching a video about the psychoanalysis of a character of a film that you haven't seen yet, but you intend to see, I think you deserve to have your film spoiled. So although it's not overtly stated in the film, I believe that the main character, Arthur Fleck, who becomes the Joker, suffers from pseudo-bulbar affect. Now this is technically not a psychiatric disorder, it's actually a neurological disorder. So very quickly, neurological disorders are disorders of like the brain, the spine and the nerves, whereas psychiatric disorders might affect the brain, but they, are, they present with problems with emotions and behaviors like schizophrenia, bipolar, depression, etc. Done loads of videos on these. If you want to know more, check them out. So I should say that pseudobulbar affect is extremely rare. I've only ever seen it once in one of my patients and it was kind of incidental. So what I mean by that was that it wasn't really that relevant in their presentation. Their presentation was that they had schizophrenia and they were hearing voices which commanded them to attack their social worker. Although throughout the film there are kind of hints that Arthur Fleck suffered from mental illness. So for example, there's flashbacks of him in an asylum. There's mention that his medications are decreasing, although it's never really clear what mental illness that is. From the bits of clues that you get throughout the film, it doesn't kind of correlate with any mental illness that I know of. So for example, if you look at his sort of scribblings in his book and his ideas, they're not typical of a psychosis like schizophrenia, for example. I have to say that the flashback of Fleck being in the asylum, I thought was done quite distastefully. And it's one of the only parts of the film that I would criticize. Uh, for example, he's in a padded cell, he's in a straight jacket, just sort of typical horror. Hollywood caricature. Having worked in many secure units, including high secure units like Broadmoor, it's categorically not like that. We never use straight jackets nowadays. Sometimes people are kept in seclusion rooms for their own safety, but that's only as a last resort and it's only for short periods of time. And I just thought the depiction inside the asylum was just a bit lazy, really. To me, it's the equivalent of the writers deciding that they wanted to have a criminal in the movie so they have him with like a mask and a bag of swag skulking around, maybe playing Michael Jackson's smooth criminal every time they're on camera. I just think it was lazy writing and I think, as I said, that's one of the only areas where the film let itself down. So how does the film depict mental illness leading to violence? This is my area of expertise. So I've, I'm not saying there isn't a correlation between some mental illnesses and violence, there absolutely is, that's literally my job, but I think there's a risk that any film, any Hollywood film in particular, could do this in a kind of callous or gratuitous way. For example, they might have somebody who's depressed who just suddenly goes on to commit a murder-suicide and kills random people, or they could have somebody who's hearing voices uh, decided that they'd just go out and attack random people. And I'm glad that the film didn't, didn't do this because firstly it adds to the stigma of these mental illnesses. It makes people incorrectly assume that people with these symptoms go on to commit violence. And whereas that does happen in exceptional cases and the kind of cases I see, it's actually very rare. But more importantly in the context of the film is just lazy writing. So I'm glad to say that Joker did not do this. It didn't do it gratuitously at all. In fact, I'd go even further to say that in the film Joker, it wasn't Fleck's mental illness that ended up pushing him down this path of becoming a megalomaniac. It had very little to do with his mental illness. Now, I've probably blown your pea-sized simple mind, but stick with me and I'll explain exactly what I mean. So I think what's far more relevant is that Fleck has all these risk factors, both historical, 
traumatic and recent which would explain or at least um, lead him down a path of potential violence. So we know that he had a chaotic childhood, we know that his mother was in and out of psychiatric institutes herself, we know that he suffered quite severe abuse, I think there's a flashback of him being tied to a radiator, and we know that the pseudobulbar affect probably came on from a head injury, possibly by a mother's ex-partner. So a head injury, again, is a neurological as opposed to a psychiatric illness, but it can lead to disinhibition, it can lead to aggression, it can lead to impulsivity in some people. So before the main events of the film, we already see that Fleck is in this dark world. He's isolated, he's marginalised, he's lonely, he's withdrawn, he gets relentlessly mocked and bullied. In one of the first scenes, he's kind of beaten up by some kids, and then later on he's bullied by his own peers who are clowns literally a bunch of clowns. And then a series of unfortunate events unfold. So he is fired from his job, he is mocked and bullied by his peers, the healthcare professionals disengage with him, they cut down his medication due to funding, he's then rejected by his potential billionaire father, Thomas Wayne. And this is all in the context of like this social disharmony and this divide that's going on in Gotham at the time that Fleck kind of absorbs. So it's much more about his social circumstances, I think, than about any potential mental illness. And I do not think it can be overstated that his access to a gun massively changed the course of events. So for example, if this was a man in the UK who couldn't get a gun as easily, he probably wouldn't have killed those people on the train. I have a lot to say about access and availability to guns, but the NRA are not a particularly stable or nice enemy to have, so I think I will keep strong. So that's like the background, and then as the film progresses, more horrible things happen to him. He's stigmatised, he's mocked, as I say, he's attacked on this train, and also he's targeted because of his inappropriate laughter from the pseudo bulba affect, which as I said is a neurological disorder. So I actually think it's all of these things in combination that pushes him to become a joker, not a mental illness. And I have to say, I think this was done really well by the film. I think the, the writing was subtle and it was clever. There is one exception to what I'm saying that he didn't have a mental illness, which is that he has these like delusional beliefs or memories, I should say, about having a relationship with a woman down the corridor. And I have to say this is not very typical. So in some psychoses, people might have like grandiose delusions, so they might believe that people of the opposite sex find them attractive just like you when you've had two and a half shandies. But generally speaking, they don't, they don't have like delusional memories. They don't believe entire episodes of things that they think have happened to them. I'm not saying it's impossible, and when these delusional memories do occur, they tend to be from a very long time ago, and it tends to be one very blunt memory as, as opposed to a sophisticated set of memories like an entire relationship. This is not typical of a psychosis. And the other bit that doesn't really fit is that at, at one point he realizes that he has these delusional memories without any kind of treatment, so his medication decrease that he suddenly gains insight and that's not the usual pattern of a mental illness. So the next question is how does this all tie into real life cases I've seen? I will answer that but before then I have a question for you my dear viewers and I will answer this myself at the end of this video but I want you to put your answers in the comments which is this what are the best and worst films that Joaquin Phoenix has been in, uh, Joker aside. I was about to say the Joker, but it's Joker. Joker aside. And, separate question, what other films can you tell me about where you think mental illness has been depicted poorly or when it's been depicted well and realistically? So in terms of the relationship between mental illness and violence, in the cases that I see, so when I work as an expert witness in court reports and when I rehabilitate patients in uh, secure units, it's very different. There's usually a direct link. So there might be, for example, a very common presentation is people with psychosis hearing voices like command hallucinations, just like the patient I briefly mentioned before who attacked his social worker because he was hearing voices that were telling him to do this and he couldn't resist. They wore him down over time. Or quite often people have paranoid delusions or thoughts. They believe that other people, sometimes strangers, sometimes people they know, wish to harm them or will attack them so they attack preemptively, which kind of makes sense if they're in that state of mind. However, Fleck was not particularly paranoid and if anything he was grandiose and he became more grandiose as the film progressed. He had the sense of power, this sense of control, and I think he got some pleasure in inciting violence and even inciting a riot towards the end. So again, I don't think this is mental illness. I think this is his twisted, kind of narcissistic, semi-sociopathic personality that's developing over time. So you could argue that he might have a personality disorder, but that's not a mental illness. If you're interested in some of these topics, I've done 
previous videos on personality disorders and also one where I tell you the difference between a narcissist and a psychopath. So before I tell you my final conclusions about this video, let's quickly discuss Joaquin Phoenix's uh, previous films. If you want to look him up, it's under Joaquin. So I think the worst films he's done are Her from 2013. If I had to describe that film in one word, it would be whack. And also You Were Never Really There from 2017. This got really good reviews, but I just thought it was a bit dull. In terms of the best films he's done, it's very tempting to say Gladiator, which is a great film in the year 2000, but that's a bit too mainstream for me. Instead, I would go for Walk the Line in 2005, which is the biopic of Johnny Cash. Also happens to be one of my wife's favorite films, if not her favorite film of all time. I thought it was pretty good. And here's a little gem for you, a film that I think many of you might not have seen because it's kind of underground cult, but I think it's amazing and it's called Buffalo Soldiers, and it was made in 2001. You should definitely go check it out, it's just great. So to conclude, I love the film Joker. I know it's kind of split audiences, but I really enjoyed it. I thought it was entertaining, I thought it was quite cleverly written and subtle. You kind of, I bought into the whole tense, the attention kind of building over time throughout the film, and you could just see all these events and factors that uh, happened to Fleck that made him into this maniacal DC villain that we love to hate. As I've said, I would argue that it's not actually his mental illness that made him the way he was. It's not even really his neurological condition, the pseudo-Barbara affect. That's one of the many factors, but overall it was his social isolation, being mistreated, being mocked, being bullied, being marginalised, feeling isolated, all of these things, as well as a couple of really um, horrible events happening to him, all of these things combined that made him the Joker, I think. I didn't think the psychiatric depiction was great, I've already bitched about the, uh, the asylum flashbacks and also the unrealistic nature of his delusional beliefs. But having said that, I also fully acknowledge that the job of this movie isn't to depict psychiatric illnesses as effectively and as accurately as it can. The job of this movie is for the audience to see how a relatable, realistic person can be pushed to the brink and become this evil maniac. And I think it did this excellently. So I would give this film a Hey. Before I go, I just really want to welcome you to this channel, A Psych for Sore Minds. I do a whole range of videos and a whole range of topics. I'm In my profession, I'm a consultant forensic psychiatrist, so I assess mentally disordered people in prisons, courts, secure psychiatric units. I cover high profile cases, I dissect uh, films occasionally like this. I talk to and interview ex-patients and ex-prisoners. I talk about individual diagnoses, I answer questions from the internet. What I'm trying to say is there's something for everybody on this channel. And you should subscribe because if you don't, then your flatulence will be even worse than it usually is guaranteed. I will be speaking at CrimeCon, which is a huge true crime convention in the States coming over to the UK for the first time ever on the 25th and 26th of September. So you've got a bit of time to cop your tickets. You can get 10% off because I've got your back if you use the code. Psych, which will all be in the description link below. Hope to see you at CrimeCon. It'd be nice to meet some of my viewers in person. Until next time, tell your favorite people about this channel, spread the love, they deserve it. Stay euthymic and do not forget, I love you.